On trial, on Capitol Hill, the president's Iran policy. You can't even tell the Congress, let alone the leaders of other countries, what's going on. On the INN health beat, love, hope, understanding, and a new way of life. Also, holy spirits, the Vatican gives its blessing to an Australian beer. This is INN, the independent news with Morton D. Good evening. There's no way to overestimate how the Iran issue has gripped official Washington. Today, high-ranking officials were summoned to the White House for a meeting. Topic, Iran. Today, a high-ranking committee of the Congress began hearings. Topic, Iran. Today, rumors intensified and the president commented about possible firings from the Reagan administration. The reason, Iran. We have two reports. First, Jeff Kamen on what Congress is doing. In your state An angry, disbelieving Congress today began a public investigation of the president's secret dealings with Iran. The Reagan administration sent the number two man in the State Department to take the heat, but he quickly confessed that he didn't know anything about the operation. And much to the shock of some members of Congress, Deputy Secretary of State John Whitehead, a Reagan appointee, disputed the president's statement that Iran had stopped supporting terrorism. I don't like to differ with my president, but I believe there is still some continuing evidence of uh, Iranian involvement uh, with terrorism. And what about America's allies, who the president had asked not to give in to terrorism, not to send arms to either side in the Iran-Iraq war? Uh, they believe that we have uh, deceived them. We have a State Department out there that's nothing but a crying towel right now, taking the complaints, and two weeks Two weeks now, after the fact, you can't even tell the Congress, let alone the leaders of other countries, what's going on. It is a time of real national shame of all the talent in America to discover at this late date, in the leadership of the free world, that the emperor has no clothes. If you leave him without clothes, if we all of us leave him without clothes, he will lose the opportunity to lead the free world for the next two years. And I don't believe any of us know that, want that to happen. He may have been poorly advised in this whole incident, but it is very important that we maintain his credibility with foreign leaders. The Deputy Secretary of State said it is time for the White House to come forward with a plan to quickly undo the damage that has already been done by the Reagan-Iran arms deal, a scheme that was hatched by the White House National Security Council. Deputy Secretary of State Whitehead was quick to point out today that the NSC was created as an advisory group, not as an agency to conduct its own foreign policy or its own military operations. In Washington, Jeff Kamen reporting. If anyone goes, these are the three candidates meeting with the president earlier this fall. On the right, Vice Admiral John Poindexter, National Security Advisor, who spearheaded the secret Iran operation. In the middle, former Wall Street Baron, Chief of Staff Donald Reagan, who pushed the Iran plan, but has not taken any blame. And making his point, Secretary of State George Shultz, who has publicly opposed the President's actions. Are there heads on the chopping block? I'm not firing anybody, was the Reagan answer this morning, and the president also was quick to shoot back at stories that some advisors had urged him to admit a mistake on weapons for Iran. I'm not going to lie about that. I didn't make a mistake. This afternoon, the president's key national security advisors were called to a closed-door meeting to try to sort out this Iran mess. The president wanted an end to the finger-pointing among his people over who knew what and when, and he wanted some ideas on what to do next. From outside the White House, this is what Mr. Reagan's been hearing. The president should immediately demand the resignations of NSC Director John Poindexter and White House Chief of Staff Donald Reagan. There's talk that Nancy Reagan, that some of his California friends are nudging the president to dump some of his staff. I'm sure that, uh, uh, that Nancy's very concerned, and I'm sure that she, knowing her, that she's talked to a number of people. Uh, but I am not, uh, uh, I'm not sure that they are going to change the president's mind. Reagan has resisted his friend's advice before, says longtime associate Lynn Nofsiger. But former Reagan advisor David Gergen says the president's people are not serving him well. Individual members of the administration have been protecting themselves, not the president. 
and they left this poor man vulnerable out there. Chief of Staff Reagan suggested this morning that we not look for any shakeup this week, and the president himself, when pressed about possible staff changes, seemed finally to leave that door open. I'm not commenting either way. I've just told you what I feel. People who know Ronald Reagan very well admit to us that he has a hard time firing anyone. Their hope is that Poindexter or Reagan or Schultz or all three will read the prevailing winds and offer their resignations, if they've not already done so in secret. For the Independent News, John Aubuchon at the White House. Coming up, will the Silver Eagle fly? We'll look at the U.S. Mint's newest investment coin. And later tonight, a bubbling controversy, an Australian beer endorsed by the Vatican. The Independent News, brought to you by Kellogg's Nutra-Grain Cereal and by Minolta. A dagger has been plucked from the heart of the presidency. That was how the government of Philippine President Corazon Aquino began its account of a failed coup attempt. The government says about 180 people were involved in the plan to kill Aquino and take over the government. Many of those involved were reported to be supporters of deposed President Ferdinand Marcos, and Defense Minister Juan Ponce Unrile. Unrile, a vocal opponent of Aquino, was dismissed yesterday as word of the coup plot got out. Today, Unrile said he's going to take a vacation and may later return to his law practice. His replacement met with the press today and said he would help the government make a fresh start. I believe that uh, we need teamwork and uh, I, I think I can join the team, the government team. In Washington, the State Department said it had no information linking the attempted coup to ousted President Marcos. A secret camera may have put some Wall Street insiders in jeopardy. The Washington Post reported today that meetings between illegal market trader Ivan Boski and many of those who gave him illegal tips were videotaped by Boski with help from federal investigators. The tapes will reportedly be used in the next wave of crackdowns on illegal insider trading. First, it was the gold rush. As Americans grabbed up the newly minted U.S. gold eagles, now a month later, it looks like a silver stampede as the mint releases the new American Eagle silver dollars. Jan Smith reports the bullion business was brisk as initial supplies went to the market. Soon after the new American silver eagle coins went on sale for the first time today, the United States mint reported a sellout. Distributors swept in with orders for all silver dollars already made. The coins will be available to the general public within the next two weeks, but dealers are selling them through advance orders for about $8.25 apiece nationwide. How many were you looking to order? The gold fever that Americans caught when the Mint recently released the new Gold Eagle coins is apparently fueling the silver sales. And even with increased production, the Mint is unable to keep up with the demand for both bullion coins. But right now it's very exciting, and I'm, we're not complaining. It's the first time in history the U.S. Mint has ever produced a silver bullion investment coin. The retail price and future value of each coin will be directly tied to the price of silver. Shoppers comparing the $400 plus price tag of the gold bullion coin are excited about the lower cost of the silver eagle. I can afford the, the silver ones, but not the gold. Uh, silver's a lot cheaper. Yeah, I um, bought the uh, gold eagle, but uh, I have to scrap up a lot of money to get a, just one coin. Dealers expect holiday shopping to boost their sales even higher. I think there are going to be a lot of stockings that are going to be stuffed with the silver coins this year. If you're a bargain hunter or investor, Mint officials advise waiting a few weeks to purchase the coins. They say prices will go down as production goes up. There is little reason to buy one now with the high premiums that we are hearing are out there because of the supply-demand situation. Mint officials say they don't know when they'll be able to produce enough of the coins to keep up with demand, but they will keep the presses going around the clock and postpone production of the annual proof set to put more American Eagle coins in the hands of collectors across the country. For the Independent News, Jan Smith, Washington. In our USA Tonight notebook, the death of an actress. She played her part till the very end. The actress was Edith Webster, the play, a comedy called The Drunkard. It was being performed at the Tosin, Maryland Moose Lodge. Edith Webster's principal scene was a death scene. Night after night, she played it well. Night after night, the second act ended that way. Edith Webster would collapse. The stage would go dark. The applause would begin. The curtain would fall. Saturday night, the second act ended that way. The death scene, the applause, the curtain. But this time, Edith Webster did not get up. She was dead, a heart attack. 
Her timing was exquisite, an actress's death, said one of her fellow actors. Edie is not the kind of person who would want to die in bed. He added, there's no grander way to depart this mortal coil than to hear thunderous applause. And that's the last thing she heard. The death of an actress, Edith Webster, who was 60 years old. Coming up on tonight's Health Feet, some courageous people fighting to lead normal lives despite their serious illness. Stay with us. Tonight on the INN Health Feed, a new educational program with some uplifting news for victims of a serious health condition. INN's Health Beat is brought to you by Anison. Down syndrome, a congenital condition that has long carried a painful stigma for many of its victims. Retardation, institutionalization, little hope of a full life. But that dismal scenario is now changing as more and more Down syndrome victims are making it in the real world. In tonight's Health Beat report, Andrea Kaiser explains that while there's no cure for Down syndrome, a new program called Mainstreaming is helping these people to live a fuller life. Hi there. How are you? Brad Silverman's happy-go-lucky attitude disguises his intense determination. This young man has achieved what was once considered impossible for children born with Down syndrome. I'm a regular student. I'm not gonna make it. Brad has made it to college despite his genetic disorder. Down syndrome victims have an extra chromosome, which causes learning disabilities and many physical problems. When he was born, uh, our doctor, plus three other supposedly specialists, checked him out, and he was uh, a down, and he should be institutionalized immediately. He had probably a, a lifespan of eight to nine years. He'd be a vegetable. Despite the doctor's warnings, Brad's parents took him home and raised him as a normal child. At 13, he had a bar mitzvah, a Jewish ceremony where he recited prayers in Hebrew. At 18, he graduated high school with the entire class of 85 giving him a standing ovation. And at 19, he entered Pasadena College, where he now faces his greatest academic challenge yet. I know that to be a regular student, I had to work as hard as anybody else in that school to become what I become now. While Brad is considered exceptional among Down syndrome children, doctors believe his case shows that with the right environment and training, there is hope for these individuals. The Down syndrome child has been unfairly, I feel, stigmatized in the past. Some of those children who have greater potential can, with stimulation and early mainstreaming, achieve a certain level. Mainstreaming starts as early as three months old with infant stimulation programs. By age two, researchers begin working with Down's children on their most difficult problem, language development. Hello, Michelle. Ah. Hello. Ah. What researchers at this hospital have learned is that Down's children have trouble speaking because they can't understand people. But a talking computer that speaks slowly and clearly is breaking the language barrier. Bubbles. Let's blow bubbles. All right, ready? Pop, pop. Pop, pop. Good talking. Research going on in hospitals like this one have made it possible for Down syndrome children to get a head start on life. But doctors caution that all the advances being made are not likely to lead to a cure for this genetic disease for many years. Still, medical advancements are making life easier for the victims of Downs. 25-year-old Melissa Sanet felt she stood out because of the mongoloid features, so she underwent cosmetic surgery. I look more glamorous. Melissa's new glamorous look gave her the courage to marry David, who is also developmentally disabled. Melissa's mother has stood behind her daughter in all her decisions, but she firmly believes Downs has not been a handicap to Melissa. She uh, was always determined to do things and uh, uh, accomplish things and said she would do them, and she, and she has. Critics of mainstreaming warn that pushing the Downs victim too hard could set the child and parent up for failure. But don't try to tell that to Melissa, Brad, or the thousands of other courageous handicapped people. It's not easy. Very hard. But, as I said, I made it this, this far. Let's see how much further I can go. We pushed. We fought. We pushed. Don't give up on it, kid. For the Independent News, I'm Andrea Kaiser in Los Angeles.
Some sweet news for the people who make Nutra sweet. The Food and Drug Administration rejected a petition today that would have banned the popular artificial sweetener. The petition, brought before the FDA by a consumer group, claimed that using Nutra sweet could cause seizures or eye problems in some people, but the FDA said the group's evidence did not show Nutra sweet to be a public health hazard. INN's Health Beat was brought to you by Anison. A ski weekend turned into a long weekend for about 1,000 snow lovers in Washington state. The skiers were trying the trails on Mount Baker when flooding washed out the bridge on the only road in or out of the area. Rescue crews trying to clear the roadway also ferried in food and other supplies to those stranded. Other Washington flooding cut train service and forced the evacuation of hundreds of families. The flood resulted from heavy rains combined with melting snow. Children all across the country are waiting in anticipation of Christmas Day, December 25th. But Christmas has already come for some of the children of Appalachia. Elliot Weiser reports that this early Christmas has to do with a little holiday magic from the Santa train. Coal country, southwest Virginia. The times are as tough as the land is beautiful. The area's lifeline, the railroads, don't carry as much coal as they once did. But today, it's not coal the rails will carry. Who are you waiting for? Santa Claus. <laughs> Let a lot of needy children around here. They like to meet the train and get a gift or two, you know. And um, a bag of candy, what they throw off, I understand. And uh, it's right nice, you know? Young and old wait for the Santa Claus special. Once a year, a CSX train with old St. Nick chugs through southwest Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Christmas has come early to the coal fields. There they are. <laughs> Hi there, little girl. Merry Christmas to you. The Santa train has run for 44 years, and for Santa and his helpers, this is the true meaning of Christmas. That's a feeling you get with all these kids and everything. That it's, it's hard to describe, but uh, it can't help but wrench your heart one way or the other. Just seeing the kids and uh, the excitement and the joy on their faces and, uh, and the uh, joy of the people that are with them, that, that means a whole lot. And it gives you a, a, a mighty fine feeling. This is what Christmas is all about, isn't it? I think so. <laughs> oh, Santa sees you over there. Almost 13 tons of gifts and candy are distributed. The spirit of giving, the adventure of receiving. I got a... Something. What you I got, got some toys in here. Uh -huh. Got some candy and something else. Got a newspaper. The Santa train is a memory now. The children and their parents are returning home. And when you think about it, it's only fair that an area that has suffered so much, like the coal fields, should be allowed to celebrate Christmas twice a year. In Southwest Virginia, Elliot Weiser for Independent News. The Pope visits Australia. That story in a moment. Tourism is big in Australia. Today, Australia gave a special greeting to a different kind of visitor who arrived with a different kind of message. Pope John Paul arrived in Canberra, the beginning of a week-long tour down under. His message today, that which protects human rights and promotes human dignity, leads to peace. May the God of all consolation bless you in every way and grant you peace all the days of your life. Amen. Tonight, police in Brisbane, Australia, have arrested a man on charges he was planning to kill the Pope. Police say the man was carrying gasoline bombs near a place the Pope was set to visit. Authorities say he told them he wanted to kill the Pope because the Pope has too much money. The Pope's visit is not without a different kind of controversy. The controversy has been brewing ever since the Vatican and an Australian beer maker agreed to a joint venture, the marketing of a papal brew. Brian Barron has the story. Sponsorship is nothing new in papal tours but one brewery has stolen a march on all its rivals here. By putting up half a million pounds towards paying for the Pope's one-week trip, the brewery is allowed to produce the first papal beer. 
The number is strictly limited to just over a million cans of cold ones, but many Australians are unhappy, though the marketing ploy has the approval of Australian bishops. We have two cans of papal beer, please. It's a bit different. You haven't seen it before? Nice papal crest. Well, here's cheers. Good luck. What's your verdict? It's a nice beer. South Australian beer always is, but I'm still a Foster's man. But this must really have raised a lot of controversy. It's upset a lot of people. A lot of people think that it's uh, in poor taste. We were the only people in this pub drinking the papal beer. The regulars stick to their own favourites. But outside, there was ferment. Doesn't seem right to me. Why not? I thought the church is supposed to be against alcohol and all that sort of thing. Everybody's out to make a quick quid, and these people are. Does it cost more or is it cheaper? A little bit more. Why pay more? Papes out everywhere. Why? Because everything connected with that bloody drink. Tastes holy, less sinful. And that's the Independent News. I'm Morton Dean. Have a good night and a good day tomorrow. The Independent News brought to you by Riuniti Peach and New Royal Raspberry and by the Remington Microscreen Shaver.